Hi, I'm astronaut Nicole Stott, and I'm going to answer your questions about space on Twitter. This is Space Support. From Zara, are we saying then that tanning in space would happen just in virtue of being in space because cosmic radiation and unfiltered UV rays? When you're in space, of course, you're above you know, the bulk of the atmosphere, and that makes it a lot more dangerous to be exposed to the sun's radiation. So we try to protect ourselves from that. Um, for the windows that we do look through, most of them have a UV filter on them, which helps protect us. Um, but there are some windows that don't. So we know in particular what those are, and we try to really limit our time in front of them. All right, Joey Pavanelli, is there Wi-Fi in space? Yes, there's Wi-Fi in space. You might not be happy with it because it's not dial-up slow, but it is pretty slow. Ah, Kevin Gomez, age limit for space travel. I hope not, because <laughs> I'd really like to go back. Um, there really isn't one set. I think that the criteria is associated more with your education, with the career and work you've done, and also from you know just a medical and psychological evaluation. How can we detect and track space debris? Which sensors were used and where are they located? All of that tracking is done from the ground and through other satellite um, resources that we have. They have a whole unit that um, tracks debris in space for us and then communicates with NASA about it. One of my greatest memories of things that I really remember is being at the window, it was nighttime outside, and watching this streak of light go below me and floating down to the other end of the station and asking my crewmates, hey, what, you know, I just saw this. Oh yeah, that's just, you know, a micrometeorite, you know, probably entering the atmosphere or a piece of debris entering the atmosphere. And I'm like, you know, like a shooting star is basically what they told me. And I remember floating there and thinking, wow, that was really beautiful. And then I also remember thinking, man, I'm really glad I saw that because that means it didn't hit my spaceship. And that's a really good thing. I don't want that hitting my spaceship. Adam asks, what is the coordinate system used in orbits, and is it the same as non-orbit journeys, such as that to the moon and Mars? This, you know, this is a really great question. On the space station, for instance, we're flying around the Earth. You can see this model here. And the way we fly, you can see this little space station at the end. So this whole space station, this is like forward. The whole space station is moving around the Earth with that point pointing forward the whole time. And we have a coordinate system associated with that to you know, let us know locations and how the station is moving. You can apply the same one that we use with um, the space station flying around the Earth to fly other um, like non-orbit journeys. It can work for you. There's also specialized coordinate systems, all different kinds of them. Sam Anderson, do you think eating a large, messy sandwich would be harder or easier in space? I don't know if it would be harder or easier, but it probably would be messier. <laughs> Things tend to float around, so if you let go of your sandwich, it's probably going to come apart and the bread will float and the stuff inside will float around. Of course, we do silly astronaut tricks with food and drink all the time. Van Slater, how long does it take to get to the moon and how fast can you go in space? Now, this is a really great question. You know, it, it takes about two days to get to the moon, the way we fly to the moon. So we launch off the Earth, we get going really fast, and we circle the Earth, and we do this, what they call, slingshot method of then accelerating ourselves toward, toward and then around the moon. That's all really cool orbital mechanics that goes on there. And it's really neat to me how we can use the gravity and spin of our own planet to accelerate a, a spaceship off into space. On the space shuttle, we traveled at 17,500 miles an hour. The guys that went to the moon, about 24,000 miles an hour. Hen Bazert, what do you do if you're an astronaut and you experience serious health problem while in space? Well, hopefully your crewmates will be able to take care of you. A number of us train to be medical officers on board a mission, and we have probably any supply you could possibly need to take care of anything. And we are in constant communication with our medical team on the ground. Worst case, if we needed to get somebody home, we could. We could do that in our rescue vehicle or the Soyuz spacecraft. I never received any training about what to do if somebody dies in space. I guess you deal with that real time but uh, we can always get somebody home if we have to. All right, from Jesus, what happens to astronauts when they come back from space? Do they have any health problems or things they have to greatly readjust to? Well, the main thing that you greatly have to readjust to is gravity. Your body just, I think, forgets at first what 
being in this load of gravity is like, and so you feel really, really heavy. There are th other things that go on with our bodies that we try to um, counteract while we're in space so that we're healthy when we get home, like your you know, bones and muscles really starting to you know, go away because you don't need them when you're working in space. So we exercise a couple hours a day up there to try to stay in shape so when we come home we're, we're feeling good. And there are things that we really don't quite understand yet about the way radiation affects us. And also, you know, we're seeing things with people's eyes where vision is changing and we think it's because of this pressure that you get on the back of your eye, but we're really trying to figure that out too. The question is, how can I be hired in NASA and what is it like? I strongly encourage you to apply for a job at NASA. Working at NASA was absolutely uh, it's the best job I could think of. I started out at the Kennedy Space Center working on the shuttle program and helping getting the space shuttles ready to fly for, for crews. And in that one job, I got to move around Kennedy Space Center and work in the Launch Control Center and then move and work in the orbiter processing facility, which was like this big hangar where the orbiter came back in and you got it, the vehicle ready to fly again. And so through that one job with NASA, I got to see all aspects of how we get spaceships ready to fly. And then before becoming an astronaut, I moved out to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And for two years, I got to work on the shuttle training aircraft, which was this modified corporate jet that we used to basically dive at the runway and train astronauts how to land the space shuttle. And in doing that job, I got to wear this really cool helmet in the T-38 trainer jets and in the shuttle training aircraft as we flew and trained astronauts. And then applied to be an astronaut and was selected. And for uh, 15 years, I worked in the astronaut office and had the opportunity to fly in space twice and spend over three months living and working on the space station. Everything about it is ultimately about improving life on Earth. And I think there's no better place to work than one where you know you're doing some kind of greater good work for not just yourself and your family, but for everybody that we share this planet with. So, highly recommend it. How often are additional supplies sent up to aid the ISS? Okay, pretty regularly, actually. And um, we do that with a number of different of cargo ships that get sent to the station. I would say it's once every couple months that we're sending things. We've got. Um, two U.S. vehicles that we use to get supplies to the space station. One of them can actually bring things home, too. Uh, we have a Japanese cargo vehicle and a Russian cargo vehicle. So there's pretty regular resupply going on. The five uh, space programs that are involved with the International Space Station are the U.S. through NASA, the Russian Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Canadian, and European. It's really great because we have this international partnership. We share food, we share supplies, we distribute that across the station as necessary, and the Russians can fly things on the U.S. vehicles, and the same is true for all the other countries as well. This is from Danny Skarka, and he asks, what will power SLS once the old shuttle engines are used up? That is an excellent question. You know, sadly, the way SLS is uh, being developed, those engines wouldn't be reused. So I think that right now they're looking at how do they build more of them. And uh, the amount of time that we'll have between SLS missions, I think they'll, they'll have the time to build new engines to power SLS. And hopefully we'll have new kinds of propulsion coming along as well. Michael Marino, wondering if the astronauts on the International Space Station ever get bored. I hope not. I was never bored in space. Uh, there's the window to look out, see Earth below you, uh, sharing stories with your crewmates, floating around, flying, and you can even bring things that you enjoy doing on Earth. So I had the chance to paint while I was in space. My crewmates played music in space. Uh, this is not a place where you get bored. When a ship blows up in space, where do the pieces go? Do they just float around in the abyss forever and ever? Well, some of them might, I suppose, depending on how fast they went away from the explosion. But ultimately, like if something blew up in low Earth orbit, it would orbit for some period of time, would eventually slow down and get dragged into the atmosphere and burn up. So this is my helmet that I wore when I flew in the T-38 trainer jets, which are the little um, NASA jets. Uh, it's an Air Force trainer jet, two seats. It's got a visor that is like a sun visor and also a clear visor. You always want to keep that down. Um, a lot of times in the movies, you'll see the actors without their oxygen mask on. 
there's not a time unless you're on the ground in a jet that you don't wear your oxygen mask. NASA was really great. They um, they would provide these helmets to you and they kind of customized them to you. You could pretty much get anything you wanted on the back. I just did my name, which I thought was simple and nice. And I really like the color blue. Thanks for watching. I'm astronaut Nicole Stott and I hope you learned a little something about space.